This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Stick around to hear more about the discount that they are offering to the upper echelon community. All right, today I'm finally tackling a subject I've wanted to cover for many months on end, but now is seemingly finally the proper time to do so. It's a dark topic, to be sure, but it's a topic I feel has become increasingly relevant throughout 2020 and will continue to be important across all of 2021. The title says it all, it really does. We are watching the fall of society, at least for America, but not in a way where the world becomes a desert or a post-apocalyptic hellscape with marauder factions or cannibals and robots, but more so in a way where what we know ceases to exist, and in its place, new systems arise that seek to solve irreparable problems that are only growing as time goes on. I'm going to break this down into three different sections, politics, media, and economy. This won't be a persuasive piece that takes a political or media or economic position of its own, but rather a look at why the current landscape as a whole has become a problem, and also attempts to look objectively, at least, at how the mere existence of these problems, regardless of where you fall on any spectrum of individual beliefs, has already begun to cripple the society that we know in a way that will not be easy to reverse, if it's possible at all. Now, I know this is a very depressing topic, and it's fair to call me a doomer for this kind of project, but I see no way around this discussion within the context of current American life, as well as various other nations globally, because the pervasive issues are only growing with time, and appear to be accelerating in multiple areas on top of that. Before going super doomer on all of you just yet, let's be happy about Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning-based community with thousands of different courses to choose from. You can pick your interests and learn from real people with real experience. For me, and this is just one of a number of courses I've taken, I want to know more about video editing, obviously. Also in another editing platform or on another editing platform because the one that I use is really super old and not effective anymore. And I found a class by Oliver Astrologo. I can tell you definitively and sincerely right now that I'll be using Skillshare over the coming months to raise the quality of my own productions because the format is excellent and the information was clean and professionally delivered. The great thing for me is that the courses move at your own speed. Since I know some of it, I can skip around. I definitely don't need to learn all of it again. So you can go fast or slow and the process of material is at your own pace. It really is convenient. The community is full of creative people with a huge range of classes to inspire and educate you on all sorts of different topics. On top of that, they have partnered with the channel and the first 1,000 people to use the link down below in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership, and after that, it's only $10 per month. For that cost, there is an incredible amount of information and learning potential on the platform, so a big thank you to them for sponsoring the channel. I know I'll be using it personally, and I hope other people will check out the link down below. Now back to the seriousness of societal deconstruction. To really begin, let's focus on media. Media is different around the globe. In some countries, it is governmentally controlled and a central authority. In others, it is a large-scale corporate structure dominated by just a few select brands. And still further, in some, it barely exists at all, aside from localized outlets. The United States trends towards a corporate network of high-profile household-accepted names, but that is currently in the process of changing. Over the span of about four years, not coincidentally, this aligns rather precisely with a particular political trend as well, but there has been a dramatic shift in partisan trust of mainstream media. And that shift has facilitated an overall drop in trust level for the general population. Now, trust by itself is not always an issue, but there is an improper perception that certain political affiliations don't have anywhere to get their news, which is effectively synonymous with the phrase, confirm their bias. Before anyone gets upset, this is a universal truth, not bound by any political party or media network allegiance. Human beings have a tendency, often a very, very strong one, to interpret new evidence as confirmation of existing beliefs, or to seek out like-minded opinions or supporting evidence directly while flat out ignoring all else discovered. To reiterate, this is a broad, consistent reality for the human brain, and when considering a dominant but waning legacy media framework, it becomes even more critical to understand. The belief that one particular political party has been largely pushed out of the mainstream media's lens might be true from an absolute numbers perspective. There are a few networks that trend generally to the left, while there's really only one main player that will consistently trend to the right. But what many fail to consider is a dramatic rise in viewership for independent and growing new media. Again, there is nothing intrinsically wrong with these changes by themselves. In fact, a lot of people might say it's a very good thing that legacy media is losing ground to new media. But let's look at an example of how this shift and the availability of bias-confirming material, no matter what topic it is, can impact one individual story. That story is Johann Hutten Pulitzer and his claimed hack of the Georgia state runoff elections live during a Senate hearing. To make this absolutely and unequivocally clear, 
I am not discussing the legitimacy, authenticity, or validity of this story, nor am I proposing my own opinions on it, for that matter. I am simply using it as an example for the purpose of objective analysis aimed at showcasing the widening gap in coverage and tone, which fuels a confirmation bias inferno to new heights. From the Georgia Secretary of State.gov website, this is an official government website, by the way, we can read the following descriptors of Jovan Pulitzer. Failed treasure hunter. Later on, failed inventor and failed treasure hunter, proceeding to disparage his invention as one of the worst tech products of all time. They continue by focusing on his failed search for the Ark of the Covenant, and then go on by asserting that he had claimed a likely fake sword had magical magnetic properties. All of this and we're only halfway through. This official government page then attacks his publishing history, citing one of his works titled How to Cut Off Your Arm and Eat Your Dog as an obvious play at discrediting what he says based on zero empirical data, and purely hinging on their assassination of his character. Ultimately, this piece concludes with a statement by the Pulpat creator, No Ink, reading as follows. Quote, the assertions made about unauthorized access to our systems are patently false. The man claiming that someone got into our systems did not happen according to our forensic analysis. There was no hack, there was no backdoor entry, there was no pump and dump, there was no access through a thermostat located hundreds of miles away in Savannah. End quote. However, as stated previously by this very same post, as a negative, there is zero proof given other than a claim of according to our forensic analysis, which is like asking a cheater, did you cheat? And they say, no, we really don't know, thereby making this entire piece a simple assassination of the man's reputation. In totality, that really is what is presented here, and nothing to discredit his actual statements. Be they true or false, that's not for me to say. Now let's examine another recount of the exact same events from the post-millennial. To once again be crystal clear here, this is not a reference to that particular news outlet as a trustworthy source. It is to showcase the divide between coverage angles of a single event. One paragraph from their article titled Breaking, Witness Claims He Hacked Into Georgia Election System and It's Improperly Connected to the Internet, reads as follows. Quote, Tech expert, avid inventor, and patent holder Jovan Houten Pulitzer of the Gold Institute of International Strategy delivered his explosive testimony on Wednesday before the state senate subcommittee, claiming that one Fulton County voting machine is connected to the internet. End quote. This is entirely different. From the official government website, viewers are served a character assassination. That really is what that article was meant to do. And from an online media outlet, they get a glowingly positive endorsement of his credibility. As a rational, objective human being, this could not be more disheartening or confusing. Gone are the days of entirely objective coverage. In its place, we see, for the most part, loosely disguised opinions presented as analysis or fact. And even when opinion itself is presented, in the form of an op-ed, if that opinion fails to align with a core demographic's confirmation bias and existing preferences, the simple publication of that opinion can result in editors being fired. Perhaps no better example can exist than the op-ed contained within the New York Times, where Senator Tom Cotton voiced a very controversial stance that military intervention should be used in the face of civil unrest. And mere days later, the chief editor at the New York Times resigned because, quote, the essay fell short of our standards and should not have been published, end quote, despite being nothing more than a simple opinion that diverged from common expectations on that particular subject thereby piercing the veil of confirmation bias for a group of readers that frequent that particular outlet in order to fulfill their existing expectations. What we see is an erosion of once relied upon media coverage. If you want to only ever read about how the system is corrupt and broken, you can do that quite easily. If you want to only ever read about how your political rivals are destroying America, you can do that too. If you want to only ever read about how dark or bright our future is, either or, it's possible, and the uncomfortable but ultimately beneficial procedure of breaking one's own confirmation bias is easier and easier to avoid every single day. And all of this comes before we've even discussed censorship. Censorship in media and big tech as well, but in reality where big tech social media platforms are used as a media dispersal pipeline directly, as well as a digital public square of sorts, they are basically one and the same thing. Censorship in media is dialing up consistently. However, that censorship is not based on rigidly defined criteria. It is based on subjective metrics of harm as defined by the company in control. Fact-checking has become a somewhat viral term recently, except there's a problem. Fact-checking should be a purely objective approach to verification of legitimacy based on empirical data. Basically, no opinion, no emotion, no subjectivity, just the facts. It isn't. The degradation of trust, however, occurs when you apply this fact-checking to the actual process of media and social media censorship. 
One of the easiest examples by far would be PolitiFact, which is aimed at fact-checking political statements across various different platforms. In one of their chosen topics, they focused on a Trump ad which claimed Biden had stated he would, quote, raise your taxes, end quote. That was the entirety of the ad. And in their own analysis, we can see the following, quote, a new ad from a pro-Trump super PAC uses out-of-context footage of Joe Biden to claim that the former vice president wants to raise taxes for Americans across the board. Versions of the ad from America First Action began airing August 4th on Facebook and on TV screens in Wisconsin and North Carolina. They focused largely on a comment Biden made in response to a voter during a February campaign stop in South Carolina. But the America First Action ad presents that remark out of context, and while some tax experts, and keep very specific note of that word, and while some tax experts estimate that Biden's plan would mean higher taxes on average for all income groups, these increases would be relatively small for all but the biggest earners. End quote. An open acknowledgement that experts have said that there would be a tax increase for all Americans, but it would be relatively small. This indicates one thing with absolute clarity. The ad, according to their own analysis in that very fact check, is not false and is not inaccurate, according to some experts, but they have decided that there isn't enough context, so it gets labeled as false, and ultimately, in this particular case, though it is long past, taken down. This is a fact check that self-admits to being inaccurate, which led to advertising being stricken down on media platforms, primarily Facebook. Even for all those that adamantly assert that all Trump advertising should be stricken from this world entirely, in perpetuity, forever, every single person watching should be able to identify that when you say, the context isn't good enough, and though the statement isn't actually false and has been explained and supported by experts, we rate it false because it wasn't explained in a way that we like. That's not a viable form of widespread moderation, especially at scale. Context can be a very difficult measurement to analyze. It is something that can be lost in translation, misinterpreted, misread, or misidentified, and dictating media standards on a simple interpretation of context, even when the statement itself is not necessarily false, can only be successful at one single thing, and that is destroying trust for whatever particular group is on the receiving end at that time. The reason for this one-way perception shift is quite simple. Those that disagree with the ad will not even know it's gone. They don't see it. Quality advertising is often not even served to those that would disagree with it or dislike it. And no one who disagrees with a political candidate will go seek out ads from that candidate or their super PACs that they did not even see just to check if they were pulled down to then analyze the censorship. What does happen is the side whose content is pulled actively on a subjective claim of you didn't do a good enough job on context for us subjectively will react to that and the spiral moves only one way. This ties back into the widening gap between Democratic and Republican trust in mainstream media or legacy media and a divergence, a very large divergence between what these two groups are now seeing. As trust wanes in what used to be primary coverage, secondary coverage becomes the priority, and this accelerates the animosity between the two groups as one side is shown, using the same previous example that we already analyzed, what amounts to a character assassination of a man making claims, and the other side describes him as a credible expert in his field with accolades to support that. I've used this example many times in the past, but the Sinclair Broadcast Group, a conservative media organization, at one point dispersed a very precise script to all of their channels. This script is eerily indicative of what media has become. Sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish and publish the same story without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think, and this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This truly shows that media is a mouthpiece for some higher agenda, and my point is not to take one side or the other on which of those agendas is better or worse or whatever, but to illustrate that as more people become aware of that reality, they lose trust in media institutions to tell them the truth or give them all of the information that they require. As they lose trust, they look for alternatives. Those alternatives seek to cultivate an audience as effectively as possible. They are mostly for-profit businesses, which pushes them into the world of confirming bias, because that is the easiest way to cultivate an audience. And the chasm widens even as you describe one single identical event, a single event that could be described fairly consistently, somewhere in the middle, not on one end of the extreme, but instead becomes two separate, entirely different explanations and worlds. But all of that is just media. Now let's look towards economics. The world is currently reeling under the weight of a global pandemic, but opinions on that pandemic are numerous. 
why, when, and how we should respond are not consistent or ever evenly enforced. And especially when discussing the United States, in particular, there is a world of difference just across state lines. The problem is that inconsistent responses have been catastrophic for small businesses. It's unknown at this point what percentage of small businesses have been closed, whether through bankruptcy or forced lockdowns, and it's further unknown how many will ever come back, but the reality is that many of them are gone for good. However, this is not an evenly distributed economic impact because larger chains and massive corporations are, for the most part, not under that same strain. Understanding why this matters doesn't even require that much of a leap, because small businesses bearing the brunt of these lockdowns simply means that a high percentage of Americans lose their ability to support themselves, a higher than acceptable percentage that is. That loss results in strain on their everyday lives, but also increases the amount of time that they spend consuming media and other entertainment. What matters even more, however, is the response. Economic downturn, not just downturn, but flat out economic evisceration at this point, means that people turn to their government for assistance. The government that requires taxes. Except the economic relief that many require is anything but consistent and entirely unpredictable. For some, there was a temporary massive influx of cash through unemployment enhancement, as well as initial stimulus money on top of that. But for others, it was a grueling process of trying to salvage their business as local and state ordinance crushed their livelihood. To make matters much worse, most of the stimulus package money was funneled directly into big businesses, the ones that, for the most part, were struggling less than their smaller counterparts. And even when small business paycheck protection loans became available, they were depleted almost instantly because the framework allowed for larger, undeserving businesses to acquire those funds. As an example, we can look at the adolescent gaming organization FaZe Clan who acquired over a million dollars from the Small Business Protection Program right around the time that they were buying a $30 million mansion for their teen members. And even more recently, they threw a large New Year's Eve party, irresponsibly participating in highly contagious activities. This is a business where teens make millions of dollars online, in an industry in particular that is seeing its biggest explosion of growth in history, and they just do obnoxious things and waste money. That's practically the entire business model of FaZe. And that is the kind of group that took millions willingly from small businesses. But that's not the only example of lockdowns being selectively adhered to. After urging others to stay home and not participate in holiday celebrations, a meaningful activity for many Americans, the mayor of Denver flies to Mississippi and spends Thanksgiving with his own family. A Pennsylvania mayor flat out banned indoor dining and then went to Maryland and ate at a restaurant inside. California's governor, where the southern part of his state is now in an indefinite lockdown, by the way, went to a fancy French restaurant with a group of lobbyists while ignoring all of his own orders. San Francisco's mayor was at the same location prior for a birthday party, I believe, and these individuals are simultaneously imposing harsh penalties and orders on other restaurants that they don't attend that prohibit them from doing business properly, effectively destroying lives. The list is endless. Nancy Pelosi ignores state orders to get her hair done, while other salons close for good, again ruining lives and destroying businesses. Lori Lightfoot, mayor of Chicago, after imposing incredibly harsh penalties on small businesses, gets her own hair done and claims, I, in the public eye, I'm on TV, so it's necessary for me. Our political leaders impose regulations and crush our ability to sustain a family. And all the while, they continue on as normal in their own lives. And this activity, like so many others, leads to one thing and one thing only. Lack of trust in government, especially in individual officials, and increased animosity. But it's not just the government. Day in and day out, we are told that hospitals struggle under the weight of this pandemic, which is the truth, but hear me out. That for the good of the world, you must be denied visitation with your dying relatives. That staff are triaging in waiting rooms and cars and parking lots while patients pile up like cordwood. And yet, in the midst of all this horrifying fear, enormous, often choreographed viral TikTok dances have been circulating where hospital staff perform lighthearted tunes and various other dances. This is not just one or two or a dozen, it's hundreds, and it's entirely within their right to do this. But the mixed messaging, like so many other things these past months, creates animosity and fuels distrust. When a child is denied visitation as their elderly parent dies and they turn on their phone to see nurses and doctors dancing to level up on TikTok, well, hopefully everyone can see that the unending conflict of what is being said versus what is being seen and experienced will eventually take a toll. 
you must stay home. Don't celebrate with your family. While in New York, the governor attempts to leverage police to break up family gatherings and shut down religious proceedings. All the while, nurses dance in your face as you are told that the hospitals are overrun and political leaders ignore the rules that you must abide by and they themselves imposed, which destroy the livelihood of millions, but don't apply to them. All of that's just the outward facing image. Deeper down, the strength of the US dollar is waning. 21% of all US dollars were printed in 2020. The debt is out of control and people are rightly becoming skeptical. An example of this could very well be seen in Bitcoin. The digital commodity, not to be confused with digital currency as many assume it to be, is skyrocketing. This is, of course, a highly volatile asset. It might not even be true by the time the video comes out, but as the US economy reels under the strain of inconsistent lockdowns and brutalized small businesses, many people are turning to a digital asset currently that is as of yet unregulated. It's highly indicative of waning faith in the US dollar. All of these factors contribute to uncertainty. A government that failed to help adequately is still on track right now to demand our taxed income. Taxed income that for many barely even exists because the government shut them down. The social media that they use with increasing frequency during all of this undermines the message that they see from their leaders as hospital staff dance in the parking lot performing choreographed routines that they must have taken hours upon hours to rehearse and their leaders are shown to have zero regard for the very laws that they impose. Meanwhile, the rise of independent media gives those that feel frustrated somewhere to go, places that often benefit directly and financially from feeding into that spiraling anger. And the fact checking that is produced for existing mainstream locations admits in its very own words to be a subjectively defined and enforced program which muddies the water between what is true and what is not instead of providing any clarity. All of it combined, the systems that we know are degrading. Last up is politics, and for a final time, I will state that this is not an attempt to disparage one side or the other, but more so to explain that the system itself is clearly broken. The main and only problem to discuss today, because in truth there are too many to discuss in any one single video ever, there's a lot of them, is the process of iteration upon a bill. The most simplistic way to phrase it is that when proposed, a bill can receive amendments. These amendments can have entirely disconnected objectives, and thus the bill itself becomes a sort of vehicle for further legislation. That is a problem because what we see now is that the coronavirus relief care package has been effectively held hostage by not one, but both political parties in a two-party system. On the one hand, Democrat lawmakers have emphasized attachments to relief bills such as subsidizing Obamacare or repealing a ban on taxpayer money bailing out Planned Parenthood, a policy that is strongly partisan and many conservatives wholeheartedly reject it. But meanwhile, on the opposite end of the spectrum, Section 230 repeal, which is a protection policy for big tech and social media companies regarding liability for content on their platform and would actually probably destroy the internet if it gets repealed, was somehow attached by Republicans to the speculative $2,000 payment to American citizens, all the while a many thousand page bill that holds things like millions of dollars for Pakistan gender studies made its way through the legislature as a vehicle for so many things that should not exist and should not be happening if they prevent the actual meaningful relief for American citizens, especially small businesses in particular, to be passed. These lawmakers are wealthy, exceptionally wealthy. Many of them do not even need their government salary owing to that salary being a tiny fraction of the worth they derive from special interests and foreign business opportunities, but they receive that salary nonetheless, and it is paid for by the people. They stall the support efforts by weaponizing that critical legislation against their opponents, and as they kill the ability of their citizens to earn a living, actively through deliberate policy, they harvest their salary and continue on like nothing has changed while violating the orders imposed on the rest of us from a personal level just to do the things that we are denied. There is a growing number of public health professionals all over the globe that claim lockdowns really aren't the answer, and yet they continue to happen with increasing intensity in certain areas. The media's role in stoking distrust is boiling over, and the result is that even when a supposed expert says something, many will simply refuse to believe it. Even when evidence is presented, again, many people simply refuse to engage with that evidence and seek out some sort of alternative that assassinates the character of the source, or instead describes their accomplishments as fantastic and credible, rather than failed and unimpressive. A typically ignored truth about science and statistics especially, in general all math really, is that framing can often dictate perception. How you present a mathematical or science-based analysis can dictate what the conclusions become. It might seem rather asinine, but the same set of numbers or data when presented differently can be used as evidence for entirely separate outcomes. 
Example, this graph right here shows the widening gap of relative happiness in the past few years for wealthy versus middle-class Americans. This is an approximation taken from a Washington Post graphic in 2018 just for explanation purposes. It would appear that as middle-class happiness slides, upper-class happiness soars, and it would also appear they are progressively widening to new all-time high differentials. Looking at this particular graph, one might reasonably determine that wealthy people are happier than ever and that middle and lower class people are progressively less happy. However, if we simply expand the graph backwards to the last time that the middle and upper class plot points intersected, the picture completely changes. No longer is this a massively expanding all-time high difference, it's actually not even a comparative high at all versus the late 1990s. And over the span of multiple decades, the gap reduced downward to intersect yet again. This graph, by simply cropping in one location versus another, can make it seem like the gap between relative class happiness is spinning out of control, but cropping different can have an entirely different perceptive result with the exact same data. And that is an issue being leveraged right now on the grandest of scales with media and COVID and science and politics and crime and racial inequity and income disparity and on and on and on, as it all blends together while confusing and provoking the population into very intense disagreement with each other. This example is obviously quite simplistic, but the ability to lie with statistics is incredibly complex. How to Lie with Statistics is itself a 65-year-old book. It can be read, I believe, in about an hour, but it will show with chilling clarity just how easy it is to make a graph and use it to mislead everyone, while never actually uttering a single falsity contained within it. The lessons in this book are timeless and only ever become more relevant as the deception of media increases. If you want it, by the way, I got that sweet, sweet Amazon affiliate link down below for you, you can buy it there. When the media profits directly from division, when the government is paid with money that they take after preventing you from earning it to begin with, when you are told that you cannot live your life, you cannot visit loved ones on their deathbed because the world is so at risk, but then witness a throng of choreographed medical workers on TikTok chasing social media clout, or a group of nurses carrying a corpse and dancing on social media, when the government prints money at a rate never before seen in history, and the legislation to help you is held hostage for partisan goals by all of your lawmakers, you begin to lose faith in those systems. An audience losing faith in those systems leads to further intensity from the media that profits from that intensity and that loss of faith further intensity in the response to harsh events as well, as evidenced by the fact that in the aftermath of this COVID relief bill being held hostage, Nancy Pelosi, Democrat, and Mitch McConnell, Republican, had their homes vandalized. These are politicians worth tens of millions of dollars each, dueling over legislation to advance their partisan goals while everyone else suffers. And ultimately, further intensity in the audience's response to the systems that they have lost faith in, which starts the entire process over again. The fall of society is not a Mad Max scenario. It's not a Terminator judgment style day of reckoning. It's a loss of faith in the institutions that our modern life is currently built upon, causing a rapid change to occur. That, I believe, is a day very fast approaching and only ever accelerating because all of the surrounding systems feed back into it and feed off of it in the particular case of the media and raise the temperature with practically every new story and every new decision. What's to be done? No idea, but it was a topic I just wanted to discuss because that's the type of thing I find myself thinking about these days. It's not gaming related, but it was fun to work on, so there it is. If you want to support the channel, there are links down below. Merch, social media, locals, Odyssey, and Skillshare with the first 1,000 uses, by the way, offering a free premium trial, which are all ways to support the channel or branch out from YouTube, as well as another YouTuber to check out for additional content, but that's it. I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching, and have a nice night.